We're back on the Remote No Pressure podcast, Bill. Hey, it's great to be back. Now, this week, we're going to take a little bit of a, a detour from our our uh, musicians on the fly. Yeah. But speaking of musicians, you recently went to a concert, didn't you, Bill? I did. I, I had a good time. <laughs> Two nights ago, I was at, at the uh, local arena and saw Metallica. That was a cool show. Is that the first time you've seen Metallica? That was my first time with Metallica. That was my first like big thrash show. I mean, I've I've been to like Ozfest a few times, uh huh, and you know, seen some pretty heavy music. But like Metallica, like bunch of dudes in their fifties, like giving it their all. Like those guys can rock for like two and a half hours. Isn't that crazy? They're in their fifties. They did. Oh, I know. I remember like the nineties when they were still like when they were our age. Right, 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 right. And they still rocked. I mean, wow. You know, I, there was a band when I was in, in high school called, um, they were like a, a punk band called MXPX. I remember hearing of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and they had um, Chick Magnet was like their main song. <laughs> right, right, right. So <clears throat> just to kind of talk about how we're all getting old. So they were like such a cool band back in the day, yep. like in the 90s. And and I would I used to surf. Uh, I had a big long board uh, put on top of my 86 Toyota Corolla. And go over to Surfside Beach and to and, and surf. That's uh-huh. what I did, right? And I sucked. I was horrible at it. I, I didn't do very good, but it was just fun to to do, you know. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I would go surfing. Of course, this is before I worried about getting the sugar. Yeah. Um. I I would eat a Snickers bar and then drink a uh not a Gatorade but something like that. It's the the Powerade. Oh, the Powerade. The Mountain Blast, which I th- the blue is really delicious. Yep. And, uh, and I would listen to ska music <laughs> and punk music. <laughs> no I, doubt. No no doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I guess they were more, were they? No, there was a band called the Supertones. Oh, I remember the OG yeah, Supertones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, so then, um, so then the MXPX was part of that, mm-hmm. you know, and they were so cool and hip, you know, and I'm like 16. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. 17, something like that. So the other night, I'm sitting there watching TV with my wife, okay? And she likes a certain show uh, with a guy, a guy named Chip and a girl named Joanna. We all know what oh, it is. yeah. Uh, the Fixer Rupper. Yep. And there, this musician from Portland or something like that, or Seattle, was moving to Waco. <laughs> you know, it's all the same thing. And I'm like, well, who's this musician guy? It was a lead singer from MXPX. Oh, wow. With the tattoos and everything, just a little older. Mm-hmm. Still in great shape, though. Still in great shape. But and still out rocking it, and I'm just like, dude, you are. are they, like, is the so band cool. still around, or is he doing his own thing? I think the band's still around. Oh wow! I think they're still around. But it was it was interesting to see how like he's aged. It's cool to see those bands who held together for many years like that. Like I remember 20 years ago was my first big show downtown here. Mm-hmm. I went to see Black Sabbath. Okay, and you know these guys are, and inversely like they're the same age now as what metallica was the other day okay and uh it's just cool to see these old time bands like that i just i say old time as we're old time like they got old timey bands a big player piano and a banjo (laughs) 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 old time they stuck together as long as they have you know they're Uh still doing what they love that's really cool to see wow yeah that is cool um i okay one of a band uh a musician i really like Mm -hmm is John Mellencamp. Yeah. John Cougar Mellencamp. Yep. The Cougar. You know, yep. we've talked about Cougars yeah. on the podcast before, but this this is a different <laughs> kind, kind of a reoccurring this theme. Is, this is a John Cougar Mellencamp. <laughs> well, they, they had, you know, the Tom Tom Brokaw has a show uh, on Access TV where oh, he interviews these machines. And a matter of fact, Tom Brokaw is from Wharton, Texas. I didn't know Not that Not too far from where I grew up. No kidding. Shout out to Wharton. Whoop, whoop. No one from Wharton listens to this podcast. <laughs> you never know. You never know. If you do, shoot we'll me. We'll put an email. a billboard up in that city. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna take all the funds we use from advertising and just buy one big billboard in a random city somewhere. for three days because that's all we can afford. You gotta, you gotta go to the pawn shop and pay for it. You know, because it's like plywood. <laughs> it's like. I would like to spend my all of my money in one place, in the most effective place possible. And yeah. To the pawn shop. To the pawn shop. Hey, so how much does it cost to rent the billboard out there? <laughs> <clears throat> well, we got to get Joey to come out and paint it. And then, uh, I don't know, Joey a ain't cheap. Weeks. Joey ain't cheap, you know. It's <laughs> out of town money. <laughs> you <laughs> paint his gas? You're, out of, you're highfalutin out of town money coming in here. It's not a very Texan accent t- you got taking, there. <laughs> taking jobs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's not a very Wharton, Texas. Um, but anyways, what was I saying? Joey on the... Uh... Oh, yeah. What was I talking Mellencamp. about? Mellencamp. Oh, so John Cougar Mellencamp. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. This is why you're here. You mm-hmm. see? You're sharp. 
you're there. You keep me on task. <laughs> you're taskmaster. No, so John Cougar Mellencamp, <clears throat> if you have Access TV, watch, watch it. But I couldn't watch the whole thing. He was kind of a jerk. Tom Brokaw or Mellencamp? Mellencamp. No kidding. I, you know, my dad ran into him up in Cadillac. Really? At her concrete plant. Yeah, he um, was building some shack up there. I think uh, the Nuge also. The Nuge had some property up north. Sure. And he was, he was kind of a jerk to his band. He's like, they're there to support me. If they don't like it, they can go start their own band. But this is my band. Wow. And he was like, I, all of a sudden, Jack and Diane was not such a good song anymore. <laughs> and I love that song. You know, in the summertime, there's some great songs by them. But I just... Sometimes the older they get, the more jaded they get too, you know? I think so. But did you know he's married to Meg Ryan? I did not. Yeah. I think it's Meg Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> if not, let's start a rumor. Let's start a rumor. At Meg Ryan. Because fly anglers are very excited about who's married to who. They love to gossip. They love to... Hey, one one thing before we go into the pod... Well, two things. First thing is, I'm listening to a new podcast, and this is not an advertisement for them, but Conan O'Brien started a podcast. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, it's called Conan Needs a Friend. I haven't paid as much attention to Conan. For one, I don't stay up that late anymore. Mm-hmm. But for two... <laughs> Because I'm I'm, in, I'm an early morning guy now, but for right. two, uh, ever since I mean he he lost something when he left the Tonight Show, I, and I know he didn't leave by his own accord. That's right, and that was that was heartbreaking because I I loved him on the Tonight Show mm-hmm. for the nine months he was there. But yeah. he he just lost like a little piece of himself when they fired him, and like he was funny on TBS where he still is. Yeah, but he's just not the same Conan. You remember he grew that beard? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a quick story about Conan. And the reason I like Conan O'Brien so much, when my parents split, my parents got divorced. My mom married Conan. My mom, one of her, no. Okay. <laughs> Not even funny. I'm sorry. No, no. So when my parents split, I lived with my dad um, and, and I would go visit my mom mm-hmm. every once in a while, like once every couple months. And she lived in like this really tiny, tiny place in a trailer park. Okay, and when I would work, and when I would go visit her, she would work, so I really wouldn't see her that much. But uh, (laughs) 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 so I really wouldn't see her that much. But um, this was like in the early '90s, and um, I would stay up, and and she didn't have cable; she had public. TV. Yep. So network television. Yeah, network television, and the screen was probably like a thirteen-inch screen. Yep. And I'd be in there by myself in this like tiny little trailer, mm-hmm. and I would watch Conan O'Brien because in her area they played Conan, but where my dad lived, they didn't have Conan. Yeah, it was like a late late show. Oh, I thought you were gonna say like because over those hills the yeah. signal can't <laughs> yeah. quite access. Yeah, that's how it was for me. I didn't have ABC growing up. Really? Yeah, because it was that was in Traverse City, ah. and there were hills in the way, and it blocked the signal to getting to where I was. Really? Yep. I just had, I just had NBC, ABC, no, I'm sorry, NBC, CBS, and Fox. Wow. Once Fox became a network, for all you younger folks who don't remember, that's right. Married with children. Oh uh, yeah, early Simpsons. Yeah, the Simpsons. Those are the good times. The good Those days. Are the good times. Good days. So, anyways, I would spend the night like watching Conan O'Brien with Andy Richter, mm-hmm. and I just thought their humor was absolutely is, on point. Is Richter still on there? He, well, he was. You know, he was born in Grand Rapids. Was he really? He was. Andy Richter was. My realtor, shout out to my old realtor, Andy Richter, uh, and so I went to Google to find his number and uh, searched Andy Richter Grand Rapids and come to find out the Andy Richter was born in Grand Rapids. He looks kind of like a Grand Rapid. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> He looks Midwestern. He looks like a Midwestern. He looks like he enjoys a cheesecake every <laughs> once in a while. Like you, you move here, and you automatically put on twenty pounds. Mm-hmm. It's just what you do. Is he still on? I, well, Conan? I think he is. Now they just changed their their time from one hour to half an hour on TBS. Oh, really? Yeah. So it'll be interesting. But I want to take Conan O'Brien fly fishing. That would be pretty cool. I do. I, I'm on a journey now to take him fly fishing. I hope he doesn't listen to this podcast because. What I said earlier, how I I just didn't like him as much now. I think he's changed, but you know we all change in Don't life. Don't hold that against me, dum, Conan. Dum, da, da, da. But you know we always we all change in life. That's right. When when you know maybe he's not like maybe he didn't lose his edge, but maybe I blame Jay Leno. That's what it is. Jay Leno's fault. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the dynamic, but I was pissed. Oh yeah, me too. I was so I stopped watching same here. Tonight Show. 
And I'm not a fan of Letterman. No, me either. So I'm like, I'm done with late night TV. Yep. So I'm done with it. I'm done with it. But the the title of Conan's podcast is Conan Needs a Friend. Mm -hmm. And I will be his friend. Oh. I'll be his friend. You know? I mean, come on. Come on, big guy. (laughs) I'll be a friend. (laughs) You know, if you really need a friend, and let's go fly fishing. So anyway, so that's pretty cool to see the fly. So I'm I'm on a journey. I'm gonna I'm gonna figure out how to take Conan we'll fly fishing. We'll come to you. Well, 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 I'm gonna figure out how to take Conan fly fishing. Southern California fly fishing. Look it up. Yeah. Now, Bill, have you ever had a bug problem in your home? Oh yeah, box elder bugs. You ever heard of them? No. So, you know tell me stink- more, Bill. Really? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> let me tell you. Back in college, an infestation. I was uh, I was running around. No, there was a. Uh, these little box elder bugs that just, they live near the um, my maple tree, and every year they infest my house. Spring and fall, I got to spray it. The really? foundation takes care of them, but I didn't know that for my first year I lived there, so I had like bugs all winter long. It was nasty. Oh my gosh. They were awful. everywhere, yeah. Oh. They're like they're like those stink bugs. They're the same family. You know those stink bugs we get in Michigan? Yeah. Actually, we get them everywhere now. Those little, uh, what are they, um, the Asian stink beetles or whatever they're called? I don't know if we're allowed to call them that. I know. I almost... I don't know the proper terminology for these bugs. I don't want to say the wrong thing. In 2019, yeah, they will, they will take you down. Kind of like the carp that are trying to invade. Hashtag not me. <laughs> the carp that are trying to invade. Yeah, um, the Asian from, carp. Wow. Well. Can you call them that? <laughs> you know what? You need to bleep that out in the edit. <laughs> <laughs> Save the Great Lakes from the <laughs> carp. <laughs> we all know what it is, but we can't say it. Unless you are, unless you are an <laughs> harp, then you can say <laughs> <laughs> if you're an <laughs> carp, you can say whatever you want, and that's the problem with the PC generation. Is these these <laughs> carp are walking around everywhere, just saying whatever they want to. <laughs> and their rap fair. music, and their rap music. <laughs> Need to build a wall. <laughs> we need to. Be- <laughs> we need to build a wall and keep these <laughs> carps out of the Great Lakes. <laughs> Maybe we can get some shirts that say like "Make the Great Lakes Great Again" and like. That's so politically incorrect. God, what is going on with us, Bill? Oh, we're countercultural, right there. The or last- are we? Or is culture? <laughs> Countercultural. Uh, do we have? I mean, do we have an implicit bias against the <laughs> carp? Do we think they're really going to do that much damage just because? Go home, <laughs> carp. <laughs> <laughs> God, it's so bad, it's so bad. Oh my God, I'm going to get emails. Okay, the reason I ask you about the bugs. Yeah, we have. Ann Miller, who was on the podcast this week, and she is um, a borderline genius. And she probably is a genius. I mean, let's be honest. Compared to you and me, she's definitely a genius. I'm I'm an idiot. I'll just say that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm not going to say. I think think on a scale of 1 to 10 that you're probably a lot smarter than me. But that's, I mean, you do... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> on a scale of one to ten you're probably smarter than me <laughs> i don't even give a number a scale of one to ten well you're probably smarter than me you know well, you're probably smarter than me so ann miller she's she's borderline genius i'll be and she probably is genius and i mean that compared to us but um she she wrote the book for a uh, hatch guide for upper Midwest streams. And what I like about the book is it talks about the hatches, you know, through the Midwest, but you turn the page over and then it has the recipe for the fly. So you can tie your fly. That is pretty awesome. It's pretty ama- It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And how she uh, created hatches actually in her house so she could study. Oh, I would not be able to do that. I'm not a big bug person. No, no, she is. That's and pretty I don't awesome. Think, I don't think her husband is a big bug person. <laughs> I think he's like, come on, I want my house back. <laughs> but it, it is amazing. It, just it, walks she's, in the basement with a jug of ortho. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oops. No, but seriously, like when have you ever talked to someone? And you're like, wow, you're 
you really know what you're talking you're about. You're a couple levels ahead of me. Yeah. Above me. Yeah. Well, well sometimes a couple, but usually it's more, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, so talking to her was really, it was fascinating to hear like That's awesome. what she's doing and how she did it. So welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Today on the Remote No Pressure Podcast, I'm very excited to have Ann Miller with us. Thank you so much, Ann. No, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Now, I heard you, um, like I mentioned before we started the podcast, um, you have a book out. Uh, and, and what was the name of your book? It's, it's The Flies of the Midwest, or what was it called again, Ann? I'm totally it's, sorry. Yeah, no, it's a Hatch Guide for Upper Midwest Streams. That's right. And it, and a lot of it is Michigan, but it's mainly through through the Midwest. Am I right? It is. So um, you can kind of separate out sections of North America. Well, let's just say the United States and um, geographically by hatches and Michigan, Wisconsin, northern Indiana, northern Illinois, um, Ohio, parts of Minnesota, uh, <clears throat> all are very similar with hatches. And um, so my book encompasses all of that. Well, I rem- and, and we, and we do have overlap with Eastern and um, a little bit Southern as well, but um, yeah, that's what, that's what my book covers. Yeah. That's awesome. We'll put a link up. It, it, it has the, um, the, the hatch and then, on the back of it, it has some patterns and then gives instructions on how to actually fish the fly, right? Well, yes. Yeah. So, Jeff, let me just... Um, so, this book, I I had been teaching quite a bit um, and this, you know, I wrote this book. It came out in late 2011, early 2012, and it took me about three and a half years to write it. And at the time, there was not really a very good book for the Midwest for hatches. Um, And my frustration when I first started fishing was trying to figure out what fly to use and what it was imitating uh, realistically. And, you know, you'd find a name, you'd find the scientific name of the insect, and then you'd go to find a fly and you know, you had no clue, no clue what the fly was and you go back and forth, back and <laughs> forth and you could purchase a million references. And it was like, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And, and anyone that's getting started in fly fishing or that's been fly fishing for a while wants something that's just one book. And, and um, so my book tells you the hatches that we have here in the Midwest and the patterns that you can use to successfully imitate them. But also very importantly, as you, as you get into fly fishing, you understand, you learn to understand that, um, you know, habitat is, is really important. And just like, you know, if you were a bird hunter, you would understand that if, I mean, this is, very obvious, but I mean, if you're going to be a duck hunter, you wouldn't go into the woods to look for those ducks and, (laughs) or you wouldn't, if you were pheasant hunting, you wouldn't go to a pond. And, um, it's very true with hatches that, I mean, if you're looking for certain hatches, for example, Hendrickson's, you have to go to streams that have a very gravelly habitat. You're not going to go to silty waters. And by the same token, if you're looking to fish the hex hatch, you have to go to silty waters to find um, the insect emerging. You, you can't find them in gravelly habitat. And and I try to really stress that. Um, and, and in my book, I explain, you know, where does the insect live? And therefore, this is the kind of water you have to go and find if you're going to encounter the hatch. So, um I try to make it simple, but um, also provide a, a nice um, kind of natural science explanation for why things occur, where they do, and, and then how to imitate them. And yes, there are recipes at the back, so people that are fly tires will you know, be able to um, tie some patterns uh, to go with that particular hatch. That's really awesome. That's a great resource, and 
what, what I wanted to talk about those, because I, I actually heard you speak here at our Trout Unlimited um, chapter in West Michigan at Scrims. And, um, you know, it's been a while. I think it was right after the book came out. And, and one of the things uh-huh. that you had talked about was, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I've heard a lot of speakers through the years and stuff, but please correct me if I'm wrong, but were you hatching insects in your basement? <laughs> Yes, that's true. <laughs> um, it's um, it's one of those little nerdy, geeky things. But um, <laughs> Jeff, let me tell you how I I started to do that. So um, when I, you know, and and how you write a book. I mean, sometimes you write a book and then you find a publisher, and um, and and there are different ways, and some people self publish, and so. Um, it's got a little bit of a long story short. A, f- a friend of mine met Frank Amato at a at a at a book show and said, "Hey, when are you gonna?" You know, there were a few other hatch guides for like Western streams, and one had just come out for Eastern streams. And she said, "When are you gonna do one for the Midwest?" And he said, "Well, I really don't know. I don't have any Midwest contacts. Do you know of anyone?" <laughs> And my friend Sue said, well, actually, I do. Um, Let me see if she might be interested. And so, you know, Frank said, hey, do you think you might be interested in in writing this sort of a book? And I I thought about it, and I thought, well, let me give it some thought, because this sounds pretty overwhelming. But um, I said, you know, this needs to be done. So I, I said, yes, I'll do it. And he said, how long do you need to do it? And I said, well, I think I could do it in three years. And I have no idea how I came up with that number, but it seemed like a good number. So in January, I I signed a contract. I was like, well, that was dumb because no bugs are hatching in January. So the clock's ticking. I I virtually wasted like five months. But um, so spring comes along. So I did a little bit of winter stoneflies, and um, but uh, spring came along, and and I went to the river, and you know I started collecting bugs, and then I would bring them home, and and the funny thing about that particular, the first season was really really hot, and everything I brought back, the the insects were dead, um, or the wings were broken, or you know I had to stop and pick my kids up from school and by the time I got home the insects had died or shriveled and it's like oh this is a disaster and had you know sort of a panic attack and said oh I don't know what I'm going to do here and I um, I had a colleague in grad school and and he had devised some artificial streams and, and I called him up and uh, he says yeah you know just do this, this, and this, and, you know, get some, um, you know, PVC piping and some, um, you know, gutter material, like what you put on a house and you kind of, you know, put it together and set it up in aquariums and, um, yada, yada, yada. And it's like, okay, yeah, I got it. I got it. So I set it all up with, with flow and a recycling pump and temperature control and, and lo and behold, you know, and then I went out and I got the river water and I put rocks and uh, this is in your, this is in your basement, right? Ann? Well, I started out in my garage and it worked so well that um, (laughs) it's like, wow, this is great. I could probably get two or three more of these. And so then I had them in the basement and, uh, I think at one time I had probably had four streams going and um, oh my god! Now and, what did you what did still your, remain? What did your family think? Still about remain this? married. I uh, want you to uh, know. I was going to say <laughs> he was like, not happy. <laughs> it's usually the guy doing some kind of shenanigan like that, you know. And the wife was like, "I don't want streams falling through my, you know, my house." But here's Ann Miller. As I'm so happy that you're on with us. That's so that's so amazing. <laughs> Now, now you're you're an aquatic biologist. That's what that's what you are. Yes. That's what you. Um, so you obviously know what you're doing, and you're into bugs. But you know, you've been doing this fly fishing thing for quite a while. When when did you actually get into to fly fishing, Ann? You know what? I probably got into it. Um, 
about 1979, 1980. So wow. a long time now. I mean, that's hard to believe, but um, I got introduced in grad school, um, happened to have um, another fellow student and my major professor who were really into fishing. And they said, yeah, we'll do this. You know, I went up to the University of Michigan bio station and was up there a couple summers and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll, um, we'll get you into fly fishing and we'll do this, this, and this. And, and, um, they introduced me to fly fishing, you know, they, and, and it happened to be during a hex hatch and, you know, we, we tramped out way out into some farmer's field and, uh, the Maple river up near Pelston ran through it. And, um, my friend said, okay, I'll, you know how to tie fly on because you, you know, this knot. And I'm like, yeah, 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 I got that. And he says, all right, I'll get you all set up. And, um, all you, I, I, I he just showed me how to roll cast. He said, now don't do anything else other than this. <laughs> and, and then they just dropped me off in this hole. And he said, this is a great spot. Now don't do anything until it, just don't do anything until, you know, you start hearing fish and then just roll it out. And then they left me there. And it's like, this was not really a teaching moment. You know, they're like, we're going off to do our own thing. So I sat there and of course I did not listen at all. And, you know, you kind of, you're like a little kid there and you're fiddling around and the very first fish you hear, you're going to start rolling at it. And, you know, before, in about inside of three minutes, I was tangled and inside of 10 minutes, I was completely broken off. And, oh. <laughs> and so I just sat there and listened as, and it was a fantastic hatch because there were just millions of hacks and wow. uh, big fish, big sucking noises. And uh -huh. like, oh, well, I'm hooked. I got to come back and do this again. And, um, and so I did, you know, wow. and, and that was really my introduction and, um, so yeah, that's, that's amazing. This was the first year I fished the hex and this year was, mm. and it was an experience like yeah. no other. It really was. I, 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 you know, like you said, the big sucking sounds and the, the, you know, they're, they're shedding their, um, you probably know the, the scientific words for it, but they're coming out of the water and it's just like the whole thing comes alive. Sometimes it's at three in the it morning, does. but it's just, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. It is. And there's, there's nothing the the whole thing that, and, and I know this doesn't appeal to everyone, but the hex hatch, it, it appeals to you on kind of a, such a primitive level because you're out at night and it's super scary and you can't see anything. And, and, and yet you're, you're drawn to this fish and it's like, it's right there in front of you and you can't mm. see it and, and you know, you can catch it. And it's like, it's harder than you think, you know, yeah. um, because you, you got to get the fly in front of them. And actually you, it, you still have to have no drag and um, it's just so exciting. And, and then when they just inhale it and they're, and they're so much bigger because these, huge fish come out and they're fearless at night. It, it's just like, ugh. I love it. I yeah, love it. It's very addictive. Now, when you started in 1979, was it kind of unusual to see other females on the water? Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I, I would have to say, well, I don't think I ever saw another woman on the water at all to be honest. Um, and, and then, you know, then I got a few years down the road and I got married and, 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 and by then I had really gotten into fly fishing, but I was kind of stuck. And I felt like there, I would just, there were certain things I hadn't figured out about it. And there was no internet at the time to, to be like, Oh, I'll just go to such and such a site and I'll learn how to cast or I'll learn how to, tie knots or you know all of that that was not there so everything was still very much printed material and it makes it seem so long ago gosh <laughs> <laughs> but um so i was getting a the the 
Federation of Fly Fishers had a, a really good newsletter that came out, and um, I just, you know, they seemed like they were doing some very exciting things. I also got Trout Unlimited's um, newsletter, and at the time, the the Great Lakes Council just seemed to have a, a very active chapter, and, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to go up to this and and meet people and you know, it was kind of a bold move I mean, to go up without a friend and, mm-hmm. and show up someplace. And, and so I did. And I met all these wonderful people who were very welcoming and um, just, you know, were like, oh, yeah, I'll take you fishing and I'll do this and I'll help you do that. And, and um, that that really kind of advanced me quite a bit. And in exchange, I just um, I just had. Oh, I think I had two little kids, like, you know, two and one or two and a half and one or something. And, um, you know, you can be pretty busy with that, but uh, I needed something else as well. And so I took on this job as an editor of their publication. And, you know, it was probably about a 16 page publication. So it was quite a bit. Yeah, no but kidding. I ended up meeting a lot of people and um, really progressing quite a bit. And um, so that's kind of, I took off from there, honestly. Yeah, that's that's awesome. You know, um, I, I don't know if you ever listened to our podcast before, but I had a pretty um, similar story as far as like going to the some guys that fish. I think it, they were with fly fishing uh, with FFY, but I think they changed the the club name or something recently there was some drama there but um i just went there on a tuesday night because they would fish every tuesday and um mm-hmm. I, sh- I showed up i didn't know anyone i just wanted to learn how to fly fish and i remember a guy named gary he's like hey can you cast this thing more than 10 feet i'm like you can't cast a flyer at more than 10 feet because i've been doing it in my backyard you know and he just took me under his <laughs> wing and he showed me how to cast it and and they were just so grateful and you know the community of fly anglers they're so eager to help, you know, and, and, Absolutely. you know, I, I was just blown away by just how kind everyone was and just like, they were excited, you know, it was like, there were no egos and, you know, c- growing up as a spin, spin fisherman, you know, and then, um, you know, all the fly fishers or fly anglers are just kind of stuck up, you know, they, but not at all. It wasn't the case at all. They were so nice and so excited to help me. And, um, it was just a great time. So I did the same thing. I just went, I didn't know anybody, but I just wanted to learn so bad that I just showed up and did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I can't reiterate that enough. And, um, y- y- you know, and people are nervous and afraid, you know, and when you feel like when somebody shows up in an event, that is such an opportunity to just go and, and greet someone and say, Hey, let's, you know, let's, let's see your cast or, you know, how long have you been fishing? You know, whatever, you know, it takes kind of as an icebreaker and you know, that person is there because they probably want to, they probably want more, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's great, you know, and and I can't, (sighs) I can't stress enough to people that are, are new to the sport or even in the middle of it or, or wherever you are. I mean, it's, it's a way to meet people and, um, it's a way to meet fish. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now that, now that you uh, go out, you, you've had this evolution, you started fishing in 1979. Your, your book is brilliant in, in, you know, um, all the work that you've done, um, to contribute to fly fishing has been amazing. Now, you're in this other stage in life, you know, you're not the only woman or an only female on the water. Now there's a lot of pushes, uh, a lot of push from corporate co- corporations who are trying to put more people in waders. They're making, um, women's waders. They're making women's boots. They're, they're doing things for females and you are part of that. I mean, you started fly girls. Can you tell us a little bit about what fly girls, uh, what that is and, and how that got started? Like what, obviously you have a passion for fly fishing, but what was the process? How did you start and why did you start fly girls and what is it? Well, um, okay. So a little story there, actually quite a bit of story. Um, 
so a friend of mine, Dorothy Schramm, and I uh, taught, let's see, let me try to put this in perspective, probably in the mid to early 90s, um, we had we had a, some really strong fly shops in Michigan, and um, they were there were a lot of fly fishing classes, probably post uh, movie, post River Runs Through, and then um, they some of the really good fly shops said, "Hey, I want to do a women's just a women's school, you know, women's workshop, whether it's a one day or a weekend," and um, the you know the state of Michigan started doing becoming an outdoors woman, and um, there were a lot of really good women's programs coming along. And and Dorothy and I taught a lot of those at the beginning, and so you know uh, you know a lot of women. Let's say we're talking hundreds of women now have gone through some of these programs, and then they were like kind of out there and it was still at a time when you could, women could go into a fly shop and I, I could go into a fly shop. I went into a fly shop in Chicago and I told my husband, I said, <laughs> now you watch, they're going to wait on you and I'm going to be ignored. He's like, Oh yeah, right. Yeah. 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 And three times oh, wow. <laughs> he was asked if he needed help. I was never once approached and on the way out, He's, you know, the third time they just said, hey, you know, is there anything I can help you with, you know? And he's like, no, but you know what? You missed a big opportunity because I don't fly fish, but my wife does. And um, she had a lot of money to spend today, but it's not going to happen. And that was in Chicago, Orvis, downtown. But and that happened to a lot of a lot of women for many, many, many years. So um, anyway, so. Uh, Dorothy and I said we 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 started doing some just women's workshop where we were highly organized. We said I you know we think there are women out there that that just want to learn, and we put some word out, and you know immediately had fifty women. We had actually had a hundred over a hundred women sign up. Oh my gosh! And so we had to do a couple different workshops, and then they they said, now what? What are we going to do after this? And we recognized that we needed to start some kind of group and and make, you know, figure out what the next step was going to be. So in 1996, we got together in my living room, literally. And in February, it was a terrible snowstorm and there were more people, only four of people couldn't make it to the meeting. It was that it was a blizzard. (laughs) Um, and we, we pretty much laid the the groundwork for fly girls and put out the bylaws and, and, um, said, okay, we're, this is our goal. We want to get, provide education and, uh, stewardship and educational opportunities for women. We don't want to restricted to only women if if a man wants to join we will very happily um you know have them join us but our our goal will be you know to get women provided opportunities make it easier for them and um that happened and and then we slowly grew and uh over the years we've literally had you know i could say thousands but um I, I don't, I don't, I can't, I don't have the numbers to, to tell you exactly how many people have uh, learned how to fly fish through us, but um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful group. So now we're, we're over 25 years old now, I guess. Um, I, I have to sit there and do the math, but um, what's been really a wonderful thing about Fly Girls is initially when, when we, when we got started, as you would with any other group, you know, you kind of mentor everything as it goes through, but as the group grows, you know, then you get little friend groups and other little mentor groups that are spun off. And then pretty soon, you know, (laughs) you had all these little friends that are fishing with each other and it's like, wow, that's awesome. Because, you know, you didn't really 
think that one through, but it happens. And um, so now there are all these little pods of women out there that uh, have little fishing units, um, so to speak, um, that travel together. They plan all their vacations together around fishing, which is kind of where, you know, I was years ago. And um, and it's happened to all these other people. And, and it's just been really very gratifying. And um, we, we, you know, still are very active. Um, we have, we have a really good board with a lot of energy. We're always looking for new people and new board members. Um, but you know, any group is only as strong as its membership. And, um, so I don't know, I've, I've been just pretty passionate about the group and, uh, very excited by what's happened with it and, and where it's headed. And um, we, re- I think part of our success um, is, has been sometimes you can have too many meetings and get really wrapped up with how something should be run. And um, in, in part of our success, I think, is that we don't have those kind of meetings. We only meet and get together and fish. <laughs> so how can you argue about that? Right. No kidding. So, Holy cow. Yeah. Well, that's really great. You know, and we, we've we interviewed um, you know, quite a few women on our podcast, and and we're really pu- having a push uh, toward that and, and doing more interviews um, with females, partly because, you know, my personal belief is that conservation is, is, um, is actually a, a public, um, a public health issue. And, um, the, the feeling that you get when you're tying, the feeling that you get when you're fly fishing, um, relieving the stress, you know, um, of the day to day, that's neither male nor female, you know, um, so, Absolutely, so, yeah. so many women are stressed and so many men are stressed. It doesn't matter, you know, but when you get on the water, um, and there is a healing effect on that in, um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited about fly girls. And, um, do you know Kim Sears by any chance? I do actually. Yeah. He's the one that gave me your name in, um, and you've come up a couple of times from other guests, but Kim, he actually sent me a, a direct message on Instagram. Thank you, Kim, for, for sending me Anne's information said, you should really reach out to her and talk to her about fly girls and, um, and I really appreciate you coming on, and we'll put up a link to Fly Girls. Um, but would you like to, if, if someone wanted to get a hold of you, we'll also put a link up to your book too on Amazon. But if someone wanted to get a sure. hold hold of you, how how would they do that? Can you just give us your information, or if you're feel comfortable with that? Uh, sure. Yeah, you can just reach me by email, um, and it's just Ann R. Miller. So just same as. Um, you know, author name, A-N-N-R-M-I-L-L-E-R. And at the very oldest of emails at AOL.com, because <laughs> I can't divorce that address <laughs> as much as I'd like to. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm convinced. And there's exceptions, but you can tell someone's like what what age they receive their first computer by their email address. So... Mm-hmm. You know, like some of that first generation's AOL, you get the disc, you know, in the mailbox, you know. And then um, my yeah. my my generation, I'm I'm almost forty, so uh, we're Yahoo, yeah. You know, like I use Yahoo, right? And now, like all these new kids these days, you know. And, and there's exceptions, of course. And I have a Gmail account too, but you know, a lot of them use Gmail. But I'm the same way. I got my Yahoo account, and every time I go to the bank, and you know, what's your email address? I'm always embarrassed, but I just can't get rid of it. It is what it is. That's who I, I am. I can't either. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, and I have a Gmail too, but I looked at Gmail. It's like, I just don't like the way your mail is set up. So I'm going to hang <laughs> on to AOL. And it's, it's so connected to everything you do. It's mm-hmm. like trying to change your phone number, I guess. And like yeah, you know, too painful. Yeah, very, very much but, so. And thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking time with me. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Jeff, and uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, so, uh, look forward to some more of these. I uh, really enjoy them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anne, and thank you for listening to another episode of the Remote No Pressure Podcast. 
Bill. Yes. Pittsburgh. Yeah. April 8th. April the 8th. If you guys would like to join us in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Monday night, April the 8th, uh, we will be speaking at the Trout Unlimited chapter there. We'd love to have you come out and hang out with us. Mm-hmm. If you want to come, um, if, if you're going to be there, let us know. We'd love to We'd love to um, hook up with you maybe before the show or after, and we're going to have a great time. It's going yeah, to be a lot of fun. Yeah, forward to that. Um, also, um, if you are a person, of course, you're all people, so I shouldn't say that because if, wow. if you weren't a person- PC much? If, uh, if you weren't a person, you wouldn't be listening yeah. to the podcast, <laughs> right? Or maybe you no. are, but you wouldn't be able to respond. Maybe people put it on for their pets when they leave so they don't get scared. And that's probably what happened. I mean, you know, we're seeing <laughs> a large 90% growth. 90% of our downloads <laughs> are people leaving it for their pets so that- <laughs> Some some guy in Minnesota is playing it at the Petco <laughs> over and over and over when he leaves at night. So the, something about our voice just soothes all the animals to sleep. <laughs> I, I got an email from them from their corporate and saying that they use our our material to help them sleep. No, but seriously, if you <laughs> no seriously though, if you are a content creator, if you are a writer, if you are a photographer or videographer and you want to be part of the Remote No Pressure podcast and what we're doing, our workload is growing very much, and the podcast is growing very much, and we would love to talk to you about some opportunities that are coming on uh, with the Remote No Pressure podcast. So um, thank you guys so much. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, all of our socials. Sign up for our mailing list if you haven't already. And also, uh, there was one other thing, and then my mind went blank. Oh, yeah. Leave us reviews. Oh, yeah. Whatever podcast platform that you're using, whether it be iTunes, Stitcher, whatever, uh, leave us some reviews. We always appreciate That'd the be feedback. Great. Unless they're below five stars. If they're below five stars, then just email just them. Just don't worry about it, buddy. Just just move on to the next podcast. No, no some bad some bad criticism is good if it's like an email form. But if, like if it's an email You don't want to like leave that for everybody to read. I mean Yeah. If you're like, You suck, Jeff, just you, email you it bleeped to me. Out- carp you, quite a bit in this episode w- yeah we're gonna get some feedback on that one for sure May, I, I hope itunes doesn't just take down the podcast too many beeps too many beeps. i wonder who else still listening right now this is the end of the podcast and like i'll bet you everybody's already gone i wonder if they're like driving you and they're so? just like these guys down. don't shut up they'd put my dogs to sleep <laughs> <laughs> man i put that on th- two hours ago and it's still going <laughs> 47 minutes ago <laughs> It's the only thing that keeps Fido asleep. No, <laughs> I don't know. It's really, it's really odd to think about because I listen to podcasts a lot, and sometimes I just check out. <laughs> yeah, I put them on. Actually, I put them on when I'm going to sleep. Like, That's what uh, you were saying. Yeah. Like, I do the same thing. I. <laughs> Well, no one's probably listening. Yeah, so I'm just gonna say whatever yeah. I want. That's right. Okay, they're all they're all checked out by now. So there's this one guy that is uh, very hyper religious. Mm-hmm. Like hyper, hyper religious. Like we're all going to hell except him because he understands everything. Yeah. 127,000, right? Yeah. I don't know. 144,000, I think. 144. That's right. Where did that get 27 I, from? I don't know. Right. I don't know. But anyway, so he posts the most random videos about like the end times and like posts all these videos that are just, um, I'm, I'm not going to say, but let's just put it this way. It's the only thing that will put me to sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> I go to his name on the Facebook, right? And I type in his name, A-A-R-O-N. Wait, I, oh yeah. And then I and this last name starts with an F. And then I click on his name. And then I, he always has, and like no one comments or likes any of his postings. They might not, he might not leave it open for that. Oh, maybe not. You can turn that off, I think. Maybe not. I like YouTube, you can, I know. Huh. But you know what's so funny is like, I still follow him. <laughs> Why? You need to get to sleep. I, I got to get to sleep. He promotes good sleep. He promotes good sleep. So maybe we should create like a sleeping app with like, but we're, see the problem we just is, talk about nonsense. the problem is sometimes I fall asleep and I have these weird like dreams of the end times. <laughs> 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 and I'm just yelling out <laughs> stuff in my sleep, you know, <laughs> maybe it's not good for me. Well, until next time, (laughs) thanks for listening to the Remote No Pressure podcast. We'll see you next week. Oh, yeah. And go fishing.